So unlike the presentations that have happened already, um, I am in a very much um, stay tuned. This is a preview. We're just getting started. We're in year one. I have like no actual data. So um, I'm excited to hopefully spark some questions because we're at the beginning. So we can we can be influenced by what other people think we should be looking at. Um, and also, I'm excited to make connections with students and mentors of students and, um, you know, just to, to talk about the data that we have. We're building on an ongoing study. Um, so we do have a good amount of data. It's just not the data that's relevant to the kick. Um, so uh, the title of my talk is from a longitudinal pre-K evaluation, parentheses, irrelevant to COVID, um, to a study of COVID impacts on child development. Um, and I'm Anna Johnson. I'm an associate professor of psychology at Georgetown University. Um, and I will, of course, start by acknowledging um, our team and study partners. Uh, so the first part of the study, the part that was focused on pre-K, um, was funded by the NICHD and multiple foundations. Um, and then we got NIMH funding um, to fund the COVID part, which is the kind of prospective future part of this. Um, and I'll make those two legs more clear in a moment. Um, but I have both um, current and former co-investigators. Um, I'm the PI of both the original NICHD study and the NIMH study. But of course, we don't do anything alone in science. Um, and for good reason. Uh, we're definitely stronger together. So my co-investigators are Deborah Phillips from Georgetown University, who's emeritus now, um, Seth Pollock at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Gabby Levis stein at UC Austin, Diane Horm at University of Oklahoma, Tulsa, um, and Gigi Luke at McGill University um, also were uh, co-investigators on the earlier part of the study. Um, and this is a research practice partnership. So very, um, in many ways, unlike some of the presentations we've already heard, like this is very applied research. So we are partnered with uh, the largest public school district in Oklahoma, which is the Tulsa Public Schools, um, and also with community programs um, that provide services to low-income individuals in the community. And that's the Community Action Program of Tulsa. They administer eight Head Start locations. Head Start is a um, free early childhood program um, for families uh, whose incomes are at or below the poverty line. Um, also partnered with Tulsa Educare, which is very similar to Head Start in its model, targeted to families in poverty with little kids. And um, we're partnered with the Oklahoma State Department of Education. Um, so here's some context about the actual study, what I mean by kind of like the first chapter and the second chapter. So the study um, is called the Tulsa School Experiences and Early Development Study, or Tulsa SEED. Um, and we started in 2016 when children were three years old. So we sampled low-income children from low-income communities attending um, early childhood education programs that exclusively or predominantly provide services to families with um, poverty level income. Um, so children that we sampled across those different partners that I just mentioned in Tulsa were three years old in 2016. And this first part of the study was funded to follow them through fourth grade, which was, you know, last year, the calendar year 2023, which just ended. Um, we sampled approximately, you know, 1,300 kids. Um, we're still following about 1,000 of them. Um, some of them have left the state of Oklahoma. We're not able to track them anymore. But if they're still in Oklahoma, we're still following them. Um, and every year from 2016 forward, we do what we call a 360 degree data collection. So this is surrounding the child and all the kind of primary caregivers the child comes into contact with both in school and at home. So we directly assess children using um, a bunch of um, NIH kind of approved uh, measures like paper and pencil measures, maybe some of the neuropsych measures that the first Judy, Judy Ford talked about. Um, neuroeducational measures, um, uh, psychoeducational measures, um, math, literacy, language, things like that. We also administer measures of executive functioning um, directly to children. And then we observe their classrooms. We use validated instruments to observe the quality and measure the quality of their classroom experiences. We interview their teachers um, and collect data about the teachers. Um, we interview the parents. Uh, and then we scrape data administratively from the programs, um, school district and state that the children attend. And so we've done this every year from 2016 forward. Um, of course, what happened in spring of 2020 when our kids were two thirds of the way through first grade is that COVID closed 
schools. Um, and in Tulsa, um, as in most of Oklahoma, um, despite being a red state, they actually closed their schools and stayed closed and did remote learning for almost a year and a half. Um, so kids spent almost all of second grade uh, in remote school and then returned to the classroom in the fall of third grade, um, which is the fall of 2021. Uh, they just completed fourth grade last year and are now a few months into their fifth grade school year. Um, so the study sample, um, just to give you a sense, uh, this was again, designed to be a study of low income students and their long-term development. Those 360 degree measures that we collected, again, not necessarily really relevant to the kick environment, but as a developmental psychologist who studies education policy, we were measuring things um, so that we could capture the effects of their early education experiences on their later outcomes. Um, and it was designed to be a sample that informs public education policy uh, that is particularly relevant for low income and minoritized and minor um, marginalized youth. So the sample reflects the purposeful sampling technique. Um, it's a majority non-white sample. Um, it's about 80% uh, Black, Hispanic, or Native American. So we have adjacent tribal lands in Tulsa. Um, so we have a decent Native American sized population. 11% um, of the sample is white um, and then a multiracial or other race ethnicity category. Um, we have about 50% of our sample is dual language learning, mostly Spanish speaking. Um, and as designed, they are um, all low income households. So their household incomes are mostly at or below the poverty level. So this is the first part of the study. This is how the study was designed. We were collecting these key constructs, trying to understand how children's pre-K education experiences when they were three, uh, kind of explain their long-term outcomes into upper elementary school and measuring these mediators and moderators and classroom context experiences and, you know, trying to essentially um, get this big perspective on child functioning. And these were our primary measures for this study as it was planned. And then school closes in first grade um, and we decide we have to keep going with this study and we have to start to see what we can say about the effects of COVID on children's learning environments. And what was obvious to us right at that moment was we have this unique ability to talk about um, resilience and you know what so many people in education policy and public health um, have you know talked about learning loss and response to school closures, but you can only really track trajectories post disaster if you know something about what the kids were doing before. Um, or else you are maybe making some assumptions about, you know, like kids who might have already been in crisis are continuing to be, you know, on the on the edge. Um, so we had this unique ability to use multiple waves of pre COVID data to understand which kids were on a trajectory of success, which kids were on a trajectory of struggle. Um, and how did this unforeseen, massively disruptive event that closed their schools and put many of their families into crisis? Uh, affect their learning and and uh, emotional, social, uh, executive functioning, et cetera, outcomes. Um, so we pivoted during COVID and immediately started collecting data on families' experiences of disruption. So we had already been interviewing parents and teachers. We added items um, about, you know, loss and change in terms of family members, health status, income, employment, household size, things like that. Um, and so we've produced a few publications um, that were kind of rapid response, you know, designed to understand, for instance, predictors of both parents and teachers, depression and food insecurity uh, during COVID-19 distance learning. So we used the data we had during COVID to try to get some information out there. Um, what predicted what first grade teachers did when they had to pivot to online learning? Were the teachers who were rated to be very good instructors in a classroom when classrooms were in person, also very good instructors when they took their uh, instruction online. What were the barriers to participation, particularly for low income and Latinx families? Um, so we tried to you know, really build up what we were collecting on COVID so that we could say something meaningful about um, the impact of this massively disruptive event on children and families. And we tried also uh, you know, to put out kind of newsletters and fact sheets and briefs and things that might be um, a little more digestible for a popular audience, for policymakers, um, and, and reported, you know, on families and teachers' experiences during 
school closures and how that might affect certain marginalized subgroups who are intersectional with race, ethnic minority status, such as those with special needs, um, overrepresented in the poverty population, for instance. Um, we tried to reframe this language of learning loss. Um, so there's, like I said before, a lot has been made of, you know, learning loss. Well, loss can be defined different ways. If you don't know where you came from before, how do you know if you've lost or just continued to be lower performing, right? So we used our rich pre-COVID data to talk about how you might define learning loss um, and why we might see bigger losses in math than reading, for instance. Um, so somewhere in 2022, um, you know, our other funding allowed us to continue doing our pre-K evaluation research as we had planned, but we also had this moment to kind of propose a new study. And that's where the work that I'll hopefully be able to come back in another year or two and talk about um, really comes in. So uh, we added measures and wrote a new grant, um, which is just in its first year right now. Uh, to measure COVID disruption, both during school closures, which we had already kind of started to collect under our original project, um, as well as family disruption that we expect to have continued after schools reopen. So I think everybody understands that COVID is not over. Uh, there's kind of this long shadow. Um, and so, you know, what has it done to families who are already in situations of instability to, you know, continue to have, um, you know, interactions with with COVID as it as it kind of um, has not gone away in our lives. Um, and then we added this dimension that I've highlighted in green, um, protective factors. So we also recognize that like some families have bounced back more quickly than others. Um, and some families are showing surprising patterns of recovery. Um, some children are showing, you know, surprising patterns of recovery despite all of these obstacles. And so we added these new measures that we started collecting just this year um, of what we might think of as protective factors that would help children bounce back more quickly from the disruptive effects of COVID at the family, school, and peer levels. Um, and so the model that we're kind of testing is not mine. It's um, Ann Mastin, who's a developmental psychologist and um, resilience researcher, has proposed this idea. I added the word COVID. But this idea that, you know, there's an acute trauma or disaster that sets children who might have previously been on varying paths of development into wildly different paths. So some of them may experience um, survival, uh, which is kind of continuing. Some may experience thriving and some may kind of succumb to the effects of COVID. And we're really interested in this zone of recovery. Like what is explaining in these post COVID waning years, which children are following which path. And because we have lots of data from before COVID, we can draw the whole line um, and really understand what's going on. So um, I know I'm pushing up on my time. So I'll just say that these are the, the data we've collected all the way along, the data we've added and the data we'll um, add and continue to collect. Our original project focused on that first window. We're picking up there and going forward, we now have funding um, to follow children into 10th grade. So the study will have gone from age three to 10th grade um, and will allow us to test um, these questions about whether COVID disruption impacts child functioning, whether pre-COVID child functioning kind of moderates the association between disruption and post-COVID functioning, and whether disruption has a long-term effect on children and whether that long-term effect can be moderated by these protective factors in children's school um, and home environments. So that is the uh, stay tuned. I hope to have more to say. Um, the title of the study is Succumbing, Surviving, and Thriving, the Development of Low-Income Students in a Long Shadow of COVID-19. And I look forward to updating you on our findings as soon as we have more of them.